Nanotechnology used to fight a common cause of blindness. The human body is unable to regenerate the key elements of our eyes. Their degeneration can even lead to complete loss of vision. But nanotechnology comes to the rescue. Using it, it was possible to grow retinal cells, which could potentially lead to the development of new treatments for macular degeneration. One of the most common forms of age-related blindness. Scientists have found a way to use nanotechnology to create a 3D scaffold for growing retinal cells, paving the way for potential new treatments for one of the most common causes of blindness. Macular Degeneration the description and results of the research were published in the journal, Materials and Design. A common cause of vision loss is macular degeneration. In this way, we lose primarily central vision, but also sharp vision and color discrimination disappear which has dramatic social and psychological consequences for us, and our mobility is also limited. This disease often leads to complete loss of vision. Unfortunately, macular degeneration affects hundreds of millions of people around the world each year, and the numbers keep rising. The cause of macular degeneration is damage to the cells of the retinal pigment epithelium, which the human body is unable to repair on its own. This is the layer of cells behind the macula. The function of the retinal pigment epithelium is primarily to provide nutrients to the cells of the eye and to remove waste. The degeneration of this layer leads to the accumulation of harmful materials that slowly kill surrounding cells. Over time, this constant degeneration widens and gradually reduces the ability to see. And here there is a field to show off for both scientists and modern technology. The former are looking for a method to fill the resulting damage. Of course, growing the appropriate cells on a flat dish is out of the question here, which is why they are produced in a three-dimensional environment on specific and prepared scaffolds. So far, Attempts have been made in this area using collagen and cellulose, but this time the scientists decided to use other methods. These scaffolds were constructed by researchers from Nottingham Trent University and Anglia Ruskin University. A method called electrospinning was used in which an electric charge is used to draw nanometer-wide fibers from polymer solutions. This guarantees that the resulting product will be thin enough. These scaffolds are therefore made of polymer nanofibers, which, in order to reduce the risk of inflammation, have been additionally coated with steroids, e.g. flacinolone acetonide. The polyacrylonitrile used in this structure provides it with adequate strength, while the jeffamine polymer is responsible for attracting water, making the scaffolding behave like a membrane. It is thanks to the attraction of water that cells can bind to this structure, and at the same time it causes them to grow. However, if this effect is too strong, 
it can also lead to their death too quickly. In general, however, the method developed by scientists led by Professor Barbara Pierschonek from Anglia Ruskin University seems to be effective as it has contributed to improving the rate of cell growth and increasing their viability, as they are now able to survive up to 150 days. Potentially, they could be transplanted into the eyes of affected patients. These studies have shown for the first time that nanofiber scaffolds treated with an anti-inflammatory substance such as flacinolone acetonide can enhance the growth, differentiation and functionality of pigment epithelial cells. In the past, scientists grew cells on a flat surface, but cells thrive in the three-dimensional environment provided by scaffolds, said Pierschonek. This system has great potential for development as a substitute for Bruch's membrane, the posterior part of the vascular membrane of the eyeball separating it from the retinal pigment epithelium. Editorial note. Providing a synthetic, non-toxic, biostable support for retinal pigment epithelial cell transplants. Pathological changes in this membrane have been identified as a cause of eye diseases such as age-related macular degeneration suggesting that our work could be a breakthrough that could potentially help millions of people around the world. So far, questions remain as to whether the resulting cells will be effective in the treatment of macular degeneration. As the scientists emphasize, it is one thing to grow cells and another to combine them with living tissues. Our brains have a fingerprint, too. They can be explored in a short time. Enrico Amico has been conducting research on the human brain for many years. The scientist discovered that each of us has an individual pattern of brain activity that can be quickly identified. Perhaps in the future it will be possible to recognize specific people by patterns of brain activity, just as people are currently identified by fingerprints. My research is looking at the networks and connections in the brain, and in particular the connections between different areas, to gain more insight into how things work, says Amico. His research consists mainly of performing brain scans with magnetic resonance imaging. A group of collaborating researchers processes the scans to generate graphs, presented as colored matrices, that summarize a person's brain activity. This type of charting technique is called a connectum. A connectum is a map of a neural network. They inform us about what the subjects were doing during the MRI, whether they were resting or performing some other tasks. Our connectomes change depending on what activity was being done and what parts of the brain were being used, says Amico. The results of the new analysis have just been published in Science Advances. A few years ago, 
Neuroscientists at Yale University studying the connectum discovered that each of us has a unique brain fingerprint. By comparing the charts generated from the MRI scans of the same people taken several days apart, they were able to correctly match them to a given study participant almost 95% of the time. Cases. In other words, they could accurately identify a person based on their pattern of brain activity. It's really impressive because the identification was done using only functional connections, says Amico. The scientist decided to go a step further. In previous studies, brain fingerprints were identified using MRI scans that took several minutes. The scientist wanted to check whether connectomes could be identified after just a few seconds of scanning. Until now, researchers have been identifying the fingerprints of the brain with two MRI scans taken over quite a long time. But can it be done faster? Nobody knew the answer to that question. So we tested different time scales to test this, says Amico. The research group found that it takes about 1 minute and 40 seconds to get useful data. We realized that the information needed to develop a brain fingerprint could be obtained in a very short time, says Amico. There is no need for an MRI that measures brain activity for five minutes. Shorter timescales are also useful, the researcher emphasizes. The scientist also found that the brain's fingerprints begin to appear most quickly in sensory areas, in particular those related to vision. The next step will be to compare the brain connectomes of healthy patients with those of those suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Based on my initial findings, it seems that the features that make the brain's fingerprint unique gradually disappear as the disease progresses, says Amico. It is becoming increasingly difficult to identify sick people based on their connectomes. It is as if a person suffering from Alzheimer's is losing the identity of their brain explains the researcher.